Okay. Um, so I've got some lecture notes for you all. Um, I, I'm, I think what, uh, when it comes to this set of notes, uh, an easy way of putting it is after, um, after today, I really don't have much else to say about static finite elements. I, I, I've pretty much said all there is to say without getting way too advanced and talking about things like, like hybrid formulations and, and, and nonlinear analysis uh, and things like that. I'm, I'm, I mean, this is an introductory course in finite elements, and there's a point when I kind of need to stop and move on to other things. And I think that this lecture and, and what we do with this lecture will kind of tie it all together. Um, after this, we're going to look at some additional issues and some additional things related to, to finite elements that don't involve just static FEA. But in the end, I think we'll, we'll have said all we need to say for the purposes of this course after we get through this stuff. Because I want to look at things like dynamics. How do you do a vibration problem? Because now I'm sure some of you civil engineers are going, why the hell do I care about a vibration problem? And there is a very clear answer to that, and that is earthquakes. Because earthquake engineering is essentially a vibrations problem. <laughs> and that's number one. The second uh, classical problem that I want to uh, address utilizing FEA is buckling. How do you calculate buckling loads, and how do you assess stability? Um, before we handle dynamics and stability, we'll actually need to talk about another type of mathematical problem in linear algebra, and that is an eigenvalue problem. How many of you have heard of an eigenvalue problem before? That's fine. Um, if you haven't heard of an eigenvalue problem before, after we do this, we're actually just going to go back to math class and look at eigenvalues. And then because eigenvalues have a number of uh, uh, applications, in this advanced stress analysis world. But after this lecture, I think I've, I'll have said all I need to say for an introductory finite element course, and that's looking at an isoparametric formulation. It is a fancy name. It sounds heavy. Some of the math looks repetitive. It may seem heavy. I pr it really isn't, OK? This is actually a formulation that's meant to be as easy as possible. That's the whole point of an isoparametric formulation. Now, Let's start talking about it. What do I mean by an isoparametric formulation? Again, I go back to my trusty old bar element because I think it's the easiest um, medium by which to actually explain what the hell's going on with, with uh, FEA. So this is my classic stiffness matrix for a 2x2, uh, a two-noted two bar element. Now, we used direct stiffness a long time ago to get this stiffness matrix, and then we proved that finite element analysis and that approximate technique would yield the same answer. But what we then did is we said, well, we really want this to be a computer applications uh, friendly uh, type of procedure. So th th this slide may seem rather innocuous, but there's a lot on it and, and a lot of um, progression that I really want you to understand. First off, we had this stiffness makes, whoop, we had this stiffness matrix before, which we got from direct stiffness. Then all this stuff down here is finite element land. But look what happened. I mean, I've got these three terms that are all equal, but there's a logical progression that goes from each of these terms. First off, this first one, AE times B transpose B integrated from X equals 0 to X equals L. So this is us looking at the mechanics of a bar element and deriving a closed form solution for a stiffness matrix. And then we said, well, I've got this X coordinate system that I'm dealing with. I don't like X coordinate systems. Or at least a better uh, a way of saying it, saying it is these don't like X coordinate systems, these computers. Instead, why don't I say, all right, let's evaluate this. Instead of X equals 0 to X equals L, let's evaluate it from Xi equals minus 1 to Xi equals plus 1. Okay. Now, there was a very specific reason for doing that, and that was to get to over here. But one thing I do want to point out again is that uh, we're integrating the same terms, but because of our change in variable, there was a sort of piece left over. And that was this Jacobian that we talked about. And we'll explore Jacobians in a little bit of a different context with isoparametric, but in the end, it's the same deal. Now, again, the purpose of converting 
from minus 1 to plus 1 is to use a numerical technique like Gaussian quadrature. And in the end, we can take this complex mechanics-based integral and convert it into counting and adding, something computers love to do. Okay? That's what this is. Okay? Now, what I want to do is I want to say, all right, let's take this approach and let's extend it to more complicated problems, stuff like that. Okay? Now, right now, you all are dealing, and, and up until this semester, we've been dealing with um, just this. I mean, really, we've spent about eight or nine weeks, ta or actually it's probably less than more like seven or eight weeks, talking about this. Two noted bars, three noted bars, two noted beams, three noted beams. I mean, we haven't been talking about uh, geometrically really complicated stuff, just been a bunch of lines. Well, that's going to change with this discussion of isoparametric formulations. I mean, if you go back to the very beginning, that day one when I was talking about some of those complex, you know, two-dimensional and three-dimensional analyses, it's using these, you know, brick elements and tetrahedral elements and, and quadrilateral elements and triangular elements, these region-based formulations, okay? Now, I don't want you to think, oh, goodness, this took forever to understand. There's no way I'll grasp this. It, 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 that's not the case. The theory and the, the formulation is the same. The only thing actually that's really different between these and these, barring the fact that we've now extended it into two dimensions and three dimensions, are your shape functions. That's really what makes these different. Because it's a different region and because you're dealing in multiple dimensions, you have to interpolate across, across that region a little differently. But in the end, it's, that's it. Once you get your shape functions, once you get that end matrix, you do the same thing. You take your derivatives to get your strain matrix or your strain gradient, your B matrix, and then use numerical integration to get your stiffness matrix, your body force vectors, your surface traction vectors. You know, we're not going to do this for every single element, you know, that you see on this screen, but the idea is the process is still the same. The, the holdup is the end matrix. Now, what do I talk about, or what, why am I mentioning an isoparametric formulation? An isoparametric formulation, it's a fancy way of saying that we can actually come up with those shape functions really, really easily, really easily. They follow some really nice patterns. If you ever hear the term serendipity elements, if you ever look at this, they're, they're called that because they just happen to come about really, really easily. All right? Now, let's talk a little bit about those shape functions, okay? Um, these are the shape functions that we have for a bar element, okay? This is for a bar element. 1 minus x bar, or 1 minus x over L, and x over L said 1 minus x bar over L. I was thinking uh, shear lag there for a second. <laughs> it's all get mixing up. <laughs> My steel design folks know what I'm talking about there. All right, so we have 1 minus x over L and x over L, okay? Shape functions, by their very nature, exhibit a very powerful set of qualities. Number one, they always equal 1 at the point of interest and 0 at all other fixed point of interest. So if you look at, I mean, when you derive your n functions for your three-noted bar on your homework, just start plugging in values. If you look at N1, you'll find that N1 equals 1 here and 0 at these two other joints, okay? You'll, you'll find that, I, I promise. And, and the same thing will hold true for the others, okay? So there are some very powerful qualities. That's the first one. The second one is that regardless of what's going on, if you sum up those shape functions, they will, in fact, equal 1, okay? What is this plus this? 1. Do the algebra. This plus this will give you one. <coughs> All right. This holds true. That pattern holds true for just about everything that we do. Um, there are a few exceptions. That pattern doesn't hold true for beams. That pattern doesn't hold true for things like plates and shells. But arguably, most of the finite element analysis that you all will do, not only from a research standpoint, but as practicing engineers, that will be the case. Okay. All right? Um, so if we recognize a couple things, um, if we recognize that shape functions 
will sum up to equal 1 and are 1 at the net points of interest and 0 at all other fixed points of interest. And we recognize that we're trying to convert everything into this minus 1 plus 1 domain so that these things can do the integration by summing. We combine those two together, we come up with a new way of actually deriving elements and that's called an isoparametric formulation. The idea is to try and make it so that these things can integrate it very easily. Okay? It will seem like a lengthy process to go from a physical element to a K matrix. We're going to go through that process you know, after we go through these notes next week. But the big point I want you to understand is how many, well let, let me go back to this. Let me ask you this question and, and I know I'm going to get some eye rolling with this, but how many of you all have any experience with things like MATLAB? Oh, God, MATLAB. Ugh. I hear, I, I, you know, some of you who had experience with computer programming, some of you, some, it's one of those love-hate relationships. You either love it or you absolutely despise it. And I, and I can understand that. But what I do want you to kind of grasp, and it's a message I'd like for you to grasp about everything we talk about this semester, is that some of these calculations, yeah, they've been long, and we've used things like Excel to speed up our, our to, to visualize our calcs and to, you know, speed them up from a calculation standpoint. But in the end, isn't a lot of what we've done this semester just one big for loop? You know what I mean? Start cycling through the elements, assemble them, you know. That's what this stuff is, you know. That's the point of it. The process seems long, but if you write that program once, you never have to write it again. That's what things like Abacus, ANSYS, FE Map, LS Dyna, Adena, that's what they do. Okay. <coughs> now, when we talk about an isoparametric formulation, um, and, and uh, when we talk about converting coordinate systems like what we did before, we said, okay, I'll convert from an X-based coordinate system to this new variable Xi. What we're doing, and, and there's um, a, a sort of a, a, a more refined mathematical term to describe that, what we're doing is called a mapping, okay? So what does it mean by uh, a, a mapping? We're taking an element that has some random complex geometry and mapping it to something that is pretty easy to, to, um, to manage. So for instance, let's say that this element here on the left represents some random four-node quadrilateral element, maybe something like this some random element. I'm modeling a, 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 a seepage analysis on a dam or something or a, 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 a heat transfer problem, whatever. It, it doesn't matter. And this is some arbitrary element in my system that I'm modeling. And the coordinates are all over the place. The, the idea is that I can say, all right, I'm trying to map this into a minus one to plus one coordinate system, right? Remember, minus one to plus one. So I can say, all right, if I look at my xi variable, it goes from minus one to plus one. So that might be where xi is minus a half. This is where xi equals zero. This is where xi equals plus one half. This is where xi equals one. And I can take this, and instead of thinking about it in these x, y terms, it's really, really complicated and really, really funky to assess, I can think about it like this. And this is something I like to deal with. It's just a simple square region from minus 1 to plus 1, minus 1 to plus 1. Now, from a Gaussian quadrature standpoint, what I'm talking about with this formulation is I'm talking about doing Gaussian quadrature, but this would be a double integral, right? Because I would be integrating across the x-axis and then across the y-axis. But in, instead, I'm talking about the xi and eta axes because I've changed it to a new variable. But in the end, this is what I'm talking about. Taking a complex element, turn it into something simple. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. I'm hearing a lot of stuff out in the hallway. Shut that. Okay. Now, there is a nice um, uh, uh, property associated with using this isoparametric formulation and converting it to this set of variables. What you'll find is that... Um, the shape functions come out algebraically a little easier to handle. I mean, look at these shape functions for a three-noted bar. Gosh, when would you ever need shape functions for a three-noted bar? My goodness. When would you ever need shape functions for a three-noted bar? I mean, ever. 
Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Good. <laughs> um, if you look at, at the, the resulting ones from an X-base coordinate system, you'll find that the, algebra, uh, the algebraic expressions are a little messy. Okay? But from an a isoparametric formulation looking at this new coordinate system from minus 1 to plus 1, they're actually a little easier to handle. The algebra is a little cleaner. Okay? So that's just something to keep in mind. All right. Now, this is actually kind of nice. This is, uh, if you remember what I said to you all earlier, the tough part, the tough part about deriving any type of finite element is your n matrix. That's the tough part. Okay. If you get that, the rest, I know the problem seems long, but it's just road. It's just plug and chug after that. The tough part is the n matrix. Let me go back a couple slides. Remember this? This is my bar element. Okay, two nodes from x equals zero to x equals l, and I converted that from x equals minus one or xi equals minus one to xi equals plus one. These were my shape functions, right? Okay. So would you agree that if I'm talking about shape functions for this element in this direction, along the horizontal direction, these are my two shape functions, right? from xi equals minus 1 to xi equals plus 1. It's the same pattern vertically as well, right? It's the same pattern. I'm going from eta equals minus 1 to eta equals plus 1. So anywhere in between, I can use the same shape functions. So it's actually really, really, really simple, okay? If I want to do shape functions for each of these nodes, all I do is multiply these two together. That's it. I told you the hardest part was coming up with shape functions. There's your answer. Now, if you don't believe me, let's do some testing. What are the coordinates of this point right here? One comma one, right? This is point three, right? What happens if I plug in 1 and 1 right here? What do I get? 1 fourth times 2 times 2. What is that? What's this? It's 0 because I have 1 minus 1. 1 minus 1, right? 0, what's this? It's zero. What about this one? Zero. What did I say was, had to be true about shape functions? They had to equal one at the point of interest, zero everywhere else. The coordinates of this point are one comma one, right? One here, zero everywhere else. Let's try another one. What about n sub four? Okay. Minus one plus one, right? If I look right here, one minus, minus one, that's two. This is 2. This one comes out 1. Do the math. The rest are 0. That's it. That, I mean, that, that's it. There's nothing really else to say. So once I get these shape functions, which I have them right here, all I do is this. I use my strain relationship. Okay. Once I get the strain relationship, take the derivatives to get the B matrix, get my C matrix, Gaussian quadrature. That's it. Th that's it. I know the, the problem looks bigger, and I know that there's a lot more going on in terms of the geometry, but the method isn't any different. It's not any different. Okay? <coughs> so, again, once you get that end matrix, you can go all the way across the board. Okay? You can calculate your B matrix, you can calculate your stiffness matrix, body force vectors, you can do the whole analysis. Okay? The only thing we gotta have we gotta make sure of is that we're accounting for all the variables correctly. Okay? Now, what I mean by that, one of the things that we do need to kind of discuss, this is something we've kind of glossed over before, and that's our C matrix. Remember that C matrix was the relationship between stresses and strains. And up until now, we haven't had a C matrix. All we've had is E, Young's modulus. 
Now we're dealing with something that's a little different. Now we've got a more complex problem. It's two-dimensional. Later on, it could get three-dimensional. Now, now it's not as simple. Now we do have a C matrix, right? Now in two dimensions, how many stresses are you dealing with? You're dealing with three. There's a stress along the x-axis, or normal stress along the x-axis. There is a normal stress along the y-axis, and then there is a shear stress, right? So our C matrix is three by three because our C matrix relates stresses to strains, okay? Now, one thing to keep in mind, it's not as simple as just putting in a bunch of E's and saying that there's the answer, okay? It's not as simple as that. Y'all remember this from mechanics? Remember that Poisson effect? If I take a member and I yank on it, not only does it get longer, it gets thinner, okay? The ratio of how much thinner it gets to how long it gets is a special term we call Poisson's ratio. Okay? Poisson's ratio changes for different types of materials. For instance, if you're dealing with structural steel, Poisson's ratio tends to be about 0.3. If you're talking about reinforced concrete or just concrete in general, it tends to be about 0.2. And it's different if you're talking about things like plastics, polymers, rubbers, or, or, or um, uh, elastomeric uh, type materials, if you're talking about ceramics, it, it's all different, okay? It just depends on what it is that you're looking at, okay? Make sense? So one of the ways that we handle that, and this is probably kind of uh, unique in 2D analyses, is we have two types of, of differentiations that we have. We have what are called plane stress conditions and plane strain conditions. Has anybody ever heard that terminology before, plane stress versus plane strain? If you haven't, no big deal. I think it's pretty easy to, um, to, to, to comprehend. In plain stress conditions, we assume that all we have is stress in this, this direction and stress in that direction. We, we assume that there is no stress acting this way. Now, because of this thing going on, like if all I have is stress this way and I yank it, that doesn't mean the plate doesn't get thinner. Make sense? So because of the Poisson effect and, and because of our simplifications, when we're assuming plain stress conditions, we will get a strain this way. Okay? Now on the opposite effect, we have plain strain conditions which say we only have strains in this direction. That doesn't mean we don't have stresses this way. Like if, if I am straining a member this way, there has to be some stress keeping it at the same thickness. Now you might go, why in the heck are you making these these two blanket assumptions. What's the purpose? It's all about the problem that you're analyzing. Plain stress conditions are more appropriate when you're dealing with really, really thin problems, like a plate. Like if I'm taking a plate and yanking on it, that is a plain stress condition. A plain strain condition is a problem where you're dealing with something that's really, really thick, okay? Now, I'm a civil engineer, so what do I relate that to? A retaining wall, okay? How long is that retaining wall in and out of the screen? It's huge, all right? But when I analyze it, I'm really only considering like a foot strip of that sucker, right? But I, when I do my analysis, I have to recognize that in actuality, that's really, really thick. So from an analytical standpoint, it would make sense to analyze this problem utilizing a plain strain formulation as opposed to plain stress, because it's not the same story uh, as this. Does that make sense? So that's kind of a flavor for you mechanical folks and you civil folks. So you can kind of at least get an idea of what you're doing and why you're doing it. Everybody good? Now, you can open up a mechanics and materials textbook and look at these values that I'm, that I'm plugging here. It's not like anything I've, I've got here on this slide is, is magical. But the idea is that this is the relationship between stress and strain, stress and strain the different C matrices represent the different types of behavior. If you analyze a dam and you use this, or a retaining wall, and you use this upper matrix, your answers won't be correct because they're not representing what's really going on, okay? So when you run some of these programs and it starts asking you, okay, do I want a plain stress element or a plain stress element, that matters, okay? That matters because you need to make sure 
that your elements represent the problem that you're looking at. Okay? <coughs> Does that make sense? Now, this stuff gets way more complicated real quick when we start dealing with materials where we have to consider it, its, its different effects. Like, like, for instance, I would argue it's by and large easier to represent structural steel as a material than it is to represent something like wood. Wood is a very orthotropic material. It is stronger in one direction than it is in another. Okay? Because of that, this C matrix, it gets much more complicated real quick. Now, I don't really do that in this class because if I started going into those materials, I start breaching outside of the world of purely finite element analysis, and now it's a mechanics and materials course and, or uh, 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 just a material science related course or a composites class. It stops becoming this course, so I, I don't really discuss it. But it is something to, to think about for later. And it also gets more complicated when you just think about things like, let's say, a concrete. Concrete is, ma is a material that is very, very strong in compression and very, very weak in. So how do you handle a material that has different properties when the stresses are applied in different directions? That stuff gets complicated real quick. You know what I mean? So it's just something to think about. And don't get me started on matrix composites and ceramics and polymers. You mechanical folks, you like to use materials that are damn complicated so <coughs> okay is everybody good with these ideas okay now the only thing left to discuss is the B matrix how do we calculate the strain because remember once we get the B matrix that yields everything else but remember where we do that change of variable we got a that little pile of junk left over of algebra and we call that a Jacobian so <coughs> excuse me remember what do these shape functions mean? What do they represent? Well, if I've got a, uh, uh, an element and I want to determine what's its displacement in the x direction or its displacement in the y direction, it's n1, u1, n2, u2, n3, n u3, n4, u4, or n1, v1, n2, v2, n3, v3, n4, v4. It's the you know, nodal displacements times the shape functions. That's what those shape functions do. Based on the nodal displacements, they tell you how the element is displaced anywhere. Okay, that's what they are. Now, this is where you're going to start to not like me very much because I'm throwing a bunch of damn mechanics at you from all over the place. Okay, this is one of those things where if you want to delve into this more deeply, I'm teaching a course next spring, uh, Advanced Mechanics. You can take that and we'll talk all about this. Okay. If not, as I see some of you are going, good enough for me, man, good enough for me. I, I understand. Um, this is all I'll say about this to try and simplify what it is you're seeing on this screen. If you recall, when we calculated strain, we said strain was the, uh, what did we say? We said it was the, the derivative of displacement with respect to x. Y'all remember that? This is no different. But what we've got to do is consider that we've got two different variables. We've got displacements along the x direction, displacements along the y direction. Remember in calculus, when you're dealing with a problem that's got um, multiple variables, ordinary derivatives suddenly become partial derivatives. Y'all remember that? So that's where I've got all these partial derivatives. Now how do you take the derivative of this? Well. The ends are, co are functions, the u's are constants, so you just factor all the constants out. So that's how I'm getting from this to this. Okay, I just factored the constants out and it's the derivative of each of these with respect to x. Okay, now why does the shear one look different? If you go back to mechanics and materials, remember what's normal strain? It's change in length over the original length. It's sort of a percent elongation. That's what strain is. Shear strain is not a, so much a percent elongation as it is a percent change in angle. Because remember, when you're shearing something, you're looking for that change in angle, the deformed shape. That's what you're after. Now, in order to do that appropriately, you have to consider the change in angle on one side and the change in angle on another. So that's why I'm adding these. Okay. 
Now, one thing to keep in mind, I know it might look like if you're actually, you start delving into this, it looks like there's a typo. There isn't. Like the derivative of u with respect to x, derivative of, well, that's a typo. I start talking and then I go, there's no typo here. And then, oh, there's a typo. That's, but this one right here, that's supposed to be a v. That one right there is supposed to be a v. All right, let me, can I, can I mark on the slide? Let's see. Will that save on the slide? Ah, I won't save. Keep this simple. Um, Sign-in sheet, there we go. What slide number is that? 298. All right. That was going to bug me if I didn't write that down. There's no typo on here. Oh, wait, there's a typo. Over here, the, this is supposed to be a mixed derivative, a derivative of u with respect to y, a derivative of v with respect to x. All right. Everybody good? Okay. Now, if I take all of this and collapse it into a matrix problem, it looks like this. All right. Remember, I've got three strains. I've got a total of eight displacements, right? Because on each node, I have a displacement in the x direction, a displacement in the y direction. So my B matrix has got to be 3 by 8, because a 3 by 8 times an 8 by 1 will yield the appropriate strain matrix. Does that make sense? All I'm doing is taking this and saying, OK, u1, v1, u2, v2, u3, v3, u4, v4, well, these are only the U terms, so it's like a term zero, a term zero, a term zero, a term zero, and just putting it in a matrix notation. <coughs> Make sense? Okay. Now, where does that Jacobian come into place? That Jacobian comes into place from that damn chain rule that keeps popping up. Okay. Now, if you remember Calc 3, when you do the chain rule, you have to do the chain rule across the board, but you also have to do it for each variable in your derivative. So, you know, I do a chain rule for the x, uh, you know, independent variable, and then for the y term independent variable, and the same thing down here. So, <coughs> if I convert that to matrix notation, what ends up happening is that generates my leftover. Remember, I'm taking derivatives, right? I'm taking derivatives and then I'm converting from one set of variables to another, okay? So that chain rule leftover, if you will, is a Jacobian. And for the purposes of what we do in our stiffness matrix, we're interested in the determinant of that Jacobian. So just essentially that times that minus this times this. I know these derivatives look a little nasty, but I think you'll see when you actually start doing them, this actually, it's, it gets boring, but it's not difficult. It's actually pretty simple, okay? <coughs> All right, so ultimately, the long and short of it is this. If I've got, a, let's say, a four-noted four quadrilateral, here's my shape functions, here's my B matrix, numerical integration, bam. The same process, it, it, it's, is it a different set of shape functions if you're doing a triangular, triangular element or a brick element? Yeah. Does the process change? No. No, the process does not change. Okay, what time is it? It's like 5.50, 5.40. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Okay, what I have done is probably engaged in a little bit of information overload with you all tonight, especially, you know, on, on a lot of this math. I want to let this sink in, okay, because this is, there's a lot going on here. I, I get that and I respect that. What we're going to do next time is this. We're going to take this math, and I want to explore, given some element, how do we do this problem, okay? How do we take a given element in a problem and go through an isoparametric formulation? And I think what you're going to find is, yeah, I get it. There's a lot of chain rules and partial derivatives, yeah. But I think what you're going to find is that when it's all said and done, it's going to be add, subtract, multiply, and divide. We're going to have to do a, some derivatives to sort of arrive at that conclusion. 
But in the end, it's add, subtract, multiply, and divide. There is a very clear pattern that we're going to see throughout this derivation. For instance, we're going to be able to take like one derivative, and then I'm just going to write the rest of them, and it's going to be pretty easy to believe me that those are correct, because they're going to follow a very nice, concise pattern. Okay? Is everybody all right with that? All right. I don't want to continue tonight because I know that I've, I get that. And I, I don't want to, you know, engage in information overload. So what I'll say for now is let's go ahead and just call it. Next time on Tuesday, be prepared to do this by hand. It's going to be another one of those derivations by hand days because, again, I want you all to go through the process. Okay? Afterwards, we're actually going to take a, a little bit of a different approach. We're actually going to start stop talking about finite elements and start looking at stress and strain. What I mean by that is, let's say you've run a finite element analysis and you've got some three-dimensional state of stress. How do you make heads or tails of it? Like, how do you take some three-dimensional state of stress and get valuable information from it. Now you all have done this before from a two-dimensional standpoint. You've used this tool called Moore Circle. Moore Circle takes a two-dimensional state of stress and extracts from that things like principal stresses, maximum shears. How do you do that in 3D? That's where an eigenvalue approach comes into play. We're going to use that approach to calculate things like principal stresses and things like stress invariance, I1, I2, I3, uh, deviatoric stress invariance, J1, J2, and J3 for a very specific reason. Any questions? That is all I have for you all today. You all have a great weekend. I will see you all next time.